Open up your Bibles to the uh, book of Judges. Look at the last verse, and then we'll move into the 14th chapter as we continue looking at the life of Samson in the Bible. Um, I want to start out with, a, with an idea and a quote that meant a lot to me this week as I was, as I was preparing this. It's from a Tolkien, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, and then the other ones that none of us have read. Um, and uh, it's one of the characters talking to an old wizard in it, and just about uh, things getting better in life, despite all of the tragedy that you're living in at the time. And, and the old wizard says to this uh, younger, younger person, everything sad is going to become untrue, and it will somehow be greater for having once been broken and lost. There's a lot of hope in that statement. I say that today just in honor of one of my uh, mentors in preaching. I never met him personally, but uh, there's rarely a week that goes by that I don't consult in what he said about a text of scripture that I'm reading, and that's Dr. Timothy Keller of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City. Uh, I saw him preach about 20, about over 20 years ago uh, in a small setting in the East, which was really a wonderful experience. But he, and there's a few others, that uh, just about everything I say, I can trace my thinking and my, 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 my thoughts back to, to these few preachers that I consult uh, week by week. Very diverse men, women. Some of them have passed on, and some are preaching today, but there's just a few people that I use as my guideposts as I work my way through a text of scripture. Dr. Keller died this week of pancreatic cancer, and uh, he, he uh, you know, it doesn't really matter how he faced his disease. He is with the Lord Jesus now, and I thank God for his life, and uh, if, you, if you understood just how deeply uh, he affected me, if you enjoy this ministry and my preaching, uh, and if you really understood how often I'm basically quoting him and people like him, you'd be very grateful too for him. So uh, I want to say rest in peace and blessings to his wife and his sons as they negotiate uh, the loss of their husband and dad and, and uh, grandfather. Today we are talking about that very issue of disasters in life and um, how in the moment of disaster and in the moment of, of trouble, um, God is at work, but that's really not, uh, that really doesn't get us by in these disasters. We really are left holding the rubble and, and facing the, the troubles of life. And faith is when we actually presume to look ahead and, and presume that there is a God who is at work in the midst of them. That's why I titled my thoughts today, this sermon, Our Disasters, um, God's Design. You know, when things go right in life, aren't we prone to say God is at work? You know, I won, hey, this week I won a big, I'm not the lawyer on it, but a big court case I'm involved with. I was victorious. God is at work. God is at work. What if I'd lost? I don't think I'd be saying God is at work. I'd be saying, I don't know what happened. I, I mean, God, are you there? And um, faith believes that God always is at work, but we're not always on the winning side. We're, I mean, we're not always on the happy side. So God is at work in our disasters even. Our disasters and God's design. So let's jump into it and read this text and then we will continue looking at this magnificent life. Believe it or not, magnificent life of faith of this man named Samson. Samson's birth is uh, what ends chapter 13. Then the woman, that's Samson's mother, gave birth to a son and named him Samson. And the child grew up and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Mahanadan between Zorah and Eshtaol. Then Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. 
So he came back and told his father and mother, I saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me as a wife. Then his father and his mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all of our people that you would go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she looks good to me. However, his father and his mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an occasion against the Philistines. Now at that time, the Philistines were ruling over Israel. Then Samson went down to Timnah with his father and his mother and came as far as the vineyards of Timnah, and behold, a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, so that he tore him as one tears a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. So he went down and talked to the woman, and she looked good to Samson. When he returned later to take her, he turned aside to look at the carcass of the lion, and behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the body of the lion. So he scraped the honey into his hands and went on eating as he went. When he came to his father and his mother, he gave some to them and they ate it. But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey out of the body of a lion. Then his father went down to the woman and Samson made a feast there. For the young men customarily did this, and when they saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with him. Then Samson said to them, let me now propound a riddle to you, if you will indeed tell it to me within the seven days of the feast, and find it out. I will give you 30 linen wraps and 30 changes of clothes. But if you are unable to tell me, then you shall give me 30 linen wraps and 30 changes of clothes. And they said to him, propound your riddle so that we may hear it. So he said to them, out of the eater, something to eat. And out of the strong came something sweet. But they could not tell the riddle in three days. Then it came about on the fourth day that they said to Samson's wife, entice your husband that he will tell us the riddle or we will burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us to impoverish us? Isn't this so? Samson's wife wept before him and said, you only hate me. And you do not love me. You've propounded a riddle to the sons of my people and have not told it to me. And he said to her, Behold, I've not told it to my father and my mother. So should I tell you? However, she wept before him seven days while their feast lasted. And on the seventh day, he told her because she pressed him so hard. She then told the riddle to the sons of her people. So the men of the city went to him on the seventh day before the sun went down. What is sweeter than honey? And what is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, if you'd not plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have found out my riddle. And the spirit of the Lord came upon Samson mightily, and he went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 of them, took their spoil, and gave the changes of clothes to those who told the riddle. And his anger burned, and he went up to his father's house. But Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been his friend. Gracious King, 
Thank you for showing us your greatest work through our greatest tragedies. And really, wasn't your greatest work of saving us through the death of your son on the cross also, in a sense, your greatest tragedy as you watched him die? And so, Father, uh, thank you that you have gone before us into tragedy, into hard times, into foolish choices we make, and into painful things done to us. Now today, build our faith through these scriptures. We pray not for head knowledge. We pray not for even practical human wisdom to get us through the day. We pray to see our Savior, Jesus Christ, and your grace that reaches into our disasters to save us by your design. Show that to us in this uh, magnificent story today. In the name of our King, Jesus, amen. Faith clings often in great pain to the promise that God is at work for good in the midst of tragedy. Faith clings through great pain uh, to the promise that God is at work. Even in great, in the midst of great, great tragedy. Samson fell in love. He was attracted to a young Philistine woman who lived nearby. The text today told us that the Spirit of God began to stir in Samson uh, in, the, in, the, in the area of what is it, Mahanadan and, and uh, Eshtaol and these Jewish and Philistine cities located, oh, I don't know, 10 or 15 miles west of Jerusalem, if you're thinking, if you know it and you're thinking of a map. But um, it was an agricultural country, and it was a good country. It had water sources more than the rest of Israel for more parts of the year. And it was in a valley called the Eshtaol Valley. There's a housing development there today called the Eshtaol Subdivision. <laughs> and I looked it up on Google, and, and I wonder who's sleeping over Samson's house. I don't know. I don't think there's any lions there either. Anyway, uh, in this area, this is a, a remarkable uh, time in Israel's history. It's known as their Dark Ages. It's about 1,000 or 1,200 years before Jesus was born. It's known as their Dark Ages because during this time, they were not unified in their, as tribes. They were routinely attacked by different uh, um, uh, nations, the, Canaan, the, the seven Canaanite nations that they were supposed to destroy and supplant and, and take over everything. Uh, they were routinely at war uh, with them. And um, they would be saved by a judge that God would raise. And Samson was a judge. It's interesting in this story, they were under a Philistine oppression. That's an interesting group of people. These aren't the Canaanites. The Philistines had been sea people that came from probably Crete and Greece, and, and they're taking over. And uh, they oppressed Israel, oppressed these people for 40 years. That's longer than any other group was oppressed. And we don't find the people of Dan or Israel, where Samson came from, crying out to God for salvation. They were all getting along is what I'm saying here. So um, God's going to be a little different in how he raises up a different kind of a judge who does his work a little differently. And he pays a great cost for it. And he costs himself greatly through his own life and decisions. So he falls in love with a Philistine um, woman. And he lived in a culture where uh, they, uh, they freely mixed with the Philistines. Just like Israel today, there's Palestinian villages and there's Jewish villages. And you can tell by, you can tell by the roofs which is what kind of village you're looking at. But there were these different villages for these different ethnic uh, nationalities and groups. And uh, Timnah was a Philistine town up the Eshtol Valley following its water source. Uh, apparently lots of vineyards there and grain and different, different crops. And it was up this valley going towards Samson's town, which was Zorah in this area. And the two towns were about four miles apart. And these people at this time got along with each other, not as equals. The Philistines had mastered the art of ironworking. They made chariots and they made swords and weaponry that they did not share. And then they charged a good amount of money to all the other farmers around there to sharpen their iron tools. So they would, they would give iron farming implements 
to the Jews who were kind of like their servants, uh, but no weapons or anything like that. And it seemed to be okay with the Jews. They intermarried with the Philistines. They lived alongside them. Uh, uh, we find Samson actually hanging out in a place called Timnah. He might have even had friends there. And he sees a girl there, a daughter of the Philistines, and he is smitten. Now, in this culture, you didn't just get smitten and then go up to somebody and say, hey, you, know, you want to go on a date or something like that? No, no, no. You went through a formal process of your parents contacting her parents. Why? Because the marriages were arranged. And... Um, they were arranged because marriage was the primary way that material goods of a family would transfer and go, into, go to children and be inherited and all that. So it was a big deal. These days, if, you know, if your daughter marries one person, you don't think you're going to be in the poorhouse because of it. That's just the way it is. They fell in love and they're getting married and that's, that's great. But in those days, those marriages had legal claims and national claims and, and uh, uh, your goods, your wealth, and everything. So it was a big deal. So Samson falls in love or is smitten by this girl. All it tells us is he saw her. I'll say a bit more about that um, in a minute. He saw her and he liked her and he came back and told his dad to start arranging the marriage. His parents, of course, were um, very uh, uncomfortable with that. First off, he just said, I saw her. And, and, and I, we routinely look at this story and say, well, he saw her. He was just a lust-filled young man who saw a pretty Philistine girl and just had to have her right now. And, that, and that's the mark of Samson's life. He saw and he went. And not fair. Not fair and not right. The book of Judges tells us that in those days there was no king in Israel and every man did what was right in his own eyes. So to see something and go for it, it did not mean you just really lusted after this hot thing down in Timnah, although I don't, I don't doubt that was there. But what it meant was, according to your best reasoning of how to attain the best life, this is what you would go for in your own eyes. And Samson says, Dad, in my own eyes, that's the way we all live now, <laughs> in my own eyes. So his parents were still very uncomfortable, and, and it... Uh, it upset and disappointed his parents and to where they're saying uh, something along the lines of, uh, you know, why couldn't you find a girl from your own people, uh, from your own tribe? When it says your own family, it just means from your own tribe, thousands and thousands and thousands of people, or even just a fellow Jew. And he said, get her for me because um, she looks good to me. There's that whole in his own eyes thing. Now, by the way, the Philistines were not one of the seven Canaanite nations that God had forbade the Jews to marry. Okay? Doesn't mean there wasn't problems with marrying them. It doesn't mean there weren't the expectation that a Jew stays a Jew and all that. But they were not one of the, you know, slaughter these nations. Oh, and by the way, don't marry them either. There are seven of them. And, and the Philistines are not one of those, one of those nations. They're new people. A higher culture, higher class, you would say, and they had a cl they built a class ruled society where they had another people group, another ethnic group, do the hard, crummy work um, for them, for less pay, for less ownership of land, for le for less everything. While the Philistines lived a higher quality class of life, it seems like Samson probably was an important family, his family in this town, because the Philistines don't have a terrible problem with the marriage happening. But there's always, at the end of the day, the possibility of owning Jewish farmland through this marriage. Isn't that what daughters are for? To trade on the open market to get more into the family? It works for me. Not really. <laughs> you notice my daughters aren't here today, or they'd be throwing stuff at me right now. But that's how it was back then. So he said, it's a good deal. Get her for me as a wife. And his, and his dad went to work doing uh, doing just that. It says in the text, the Bible, or that his parents, in verse 4, did not know that the Lord was at work behind the scenes to use Samson to uh, deliver the Jews. His parents didn't know it. They were just stepping into something that became a tragedy. But all through the book of Judges, just like the book of Ruth, the authors are always whispering to us, 
You see that? That's God actually at work there. Watch what he does here. And that's what they're whispering to us today. You see this tragedy of a life? This is God at work. Just, just watch. Just watch. So his parents had no idea um, that God was at work, as we saw in the last chapter. They, weren't, they didn't seem like spiritually the sharpest tools in the box, to tell you the truth. So they didn't, they didn't even think about that. Well, on the way, they're outside Timnah in the vineyards before they get to the, uh, to, to, into the party. And a lion comes out and attacks Samson. Lions were all over that area, and anywhere there's a water source, there's a, all kinds of juicy deer and all kinds of stuff, and the lions would end up moving in because that's where you'd eat and that's where you'd live. And so a lion, young lion, rushes out and attacks Samson. And Samson, as the text tells us, uh, kills this lion. I think he, he killed it pretty quickly, really, because it tells us that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. And there's no indication that anybody saw lion claw marks or anything when he ended up at the feast or anything. So it actually seems that lion, you know, I don't know if he did a little jujitsu or what he possibly did, but there he is. He kills a lion and he rips it apart. It's little things like that that tell us that the God's spirit is at work and that there's a supernatural thing happening. Uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe Ben could kill a lion. But you're not going to rip it apart, you know. Um, he rips it apart, just like you would a, a, young, a young animal that you were going to eat or something, a young goat. Well, he uh, does not tell his parents about what had happened with that lion. That's important. About a year later, they're on their way to the wedding, the wedding feast. Seven-day party, seven days of drinking and partying and eating uh, ending with the probably some kind of Philistine ceremony or, or something, and then the wedding night. Hallelujah! You know, but at the end of that week, man, you get her. You get your marriage. You start your life as man and wife. And so, big, big deal. Seven week, uh, seven week party. So they go down there to start the the uh, the festivities, and on the same place, Samson passes by. Looks like his parents were either in front of him or behind him. He wasn't walking with his parents. Kind of like when I had to, used to let my seventh grader out two blocks from school so that nobody saw her dad with you know, dropping her off. I don't know. He wasn't with his parents. And he sees the carcass of this lion. It's about a year later. And bees have taken up a home in it, and they've made a hive, and there's honey. And Samson sees it and sloshes it up in his hand. This is a valuable, valuable thing in that culture. And, he, ha and he, bring he eats it, and he gives some to his parents. Uh, he wasn't doing anything really wrong. Uh, he'd taken Nazar uh, he was living as a Nazarite, but Nazarites could certainly be around dead animals. Otherwise, they'd all be vegetarians, but they weren't. So no problem there. But he didn't tell his parents about it. We'll see subsequently that the fact that his parents didn't know about the lion at all, either killing it or the whole honey thing later, absolved them from any possibility of being accused of being part of a plot to get rich off the Philistines. They really didn't know. And the author is telling us, this is from God, because even Samson's not really thinking about this at all. So they show up at the party. He didn't tell his parents about the, the, honey, the honey situation with the with the dead, dried-out carcass of a lion, which, by the way, does sound kind of gross. Does, maybe that's why he didn't say anything. Hey, Mom, Dad, you got some honey. How's it taste? Yeah, you know where it comes from? The liver of a lion, right, right in there. It was really something. And how's that taste, you know? Bad way to start the, the wedding festivities. So they get to the feast. It's seven days of a party. This would have occurred about a year after the engagement. And it was a drinking party for seven days. Uh, just so you know that I do my homework, Philistine beer mugs have been excavated. Uh, yeah, yeah, there, there are remnants of that. I don't, yeah, so, yeah, lots of beer, lots of drinking, lots of food. And the party goes on. And Samson, probably well into his cups, decides to really get the party going. He's probably feeling, like, pretty insecure coming from the lower class people and being... In the, in the Philistine 
city, I, I don't know exactly, but he makes up a, a riddle that he'll tell them and makes a bet. In the ancient Near Eastern world, people loved riddles. They loved, they loved uh, telling riddles to people. And so he proposes a challenge, a riddle. And the riddle's prize would be 30 changes of clothing, which, by the way, was a tremendous wealth, tremendous, unspeakable wealth. Clothes there and then lasted a long, long, long time. The materials were good, thick, embroidered with, I mean, they could be embroidered with gold thread and, you know, just crazy how, how uh, the, the, the wealth of these clothing, they weren't, it wasn't a throwaway society and 30 changes of clothing was a fortune. So he makes a deal with them. I'm going to tell you a riddle. Actually, he said it like this. I'm going to tell you a riddle. And if you tell me, you get 30 changes of clothing, and, you know. It's probably how it actually sounded. From what I understand of people that have drunk before, that's how they sound. Uh, okay, moving on. So he tells him this riddle. And the, riddle, the sharing of the riddle uh, is, is really interesting in terms, of, in terms of its Hebrew. It's a simple poem, a simple line. It's two lines, three words per line. And here's the way it would sound in the Hebrew. Remember this because it comes out later. Here's how it would sound. From eater, eats. From strong, sweet. A riddle is only fair. It has to, it has to, a riddle has some rules to it. It can only be fair if the answer to the riddle can be discovered by the, by, the, by the information in the riddle. And the information in the riddle has to be recognizable to the people hearing about it. You can't tell me a riddle from Nigeria or Germany or somewhere that's just ha, 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 so funny to them, expecting me to understand something about their culture that's in the riddle that I would have no, you know, it wouldn't be fair. And so he told a riddle that was patently unfair. That's how riddles work. And what's fun about them is that you know you should be able to solve the riddle. And you're probably going to feel kind of dumb when you don't. So here's a riddle for you. What gets wetter and wetter the more it dries? A towel. A towel. Who said that? Yes, sir. One change of clothing for you. That was really good. That was good. Let's, get, let's, let's go a little further in this riddle road we're on here. What goes around the world and stays in a corner? A stamp. A stamp. Around the world stays in a corner. Okay, okay. Um, what was invented by a man who didn't want it, bought by a man who didn't need it, and used by a man who doesn't know it. Bought by a man who doesn't want it, found, or, uh, excuse me, invented by a man who doesn't want it, bought by a man who doesn't need it, used by a man who doesn't know it. Hmm? A coffin. I invented it because I don't need it. I buy it, but I don't, you know, I don't, don't want it or need it. And then finally it's used by a guy that doesn't know it because he's dead. And you're putting me in a coffin. A coffin! How's that feel to, you know, you know, not know the answer, but then hear about, oh, the clues were all right there. I just wasn't thinking of it that way. So Samson really took it to these guys with his riddle. Uh, out of the eater, or out of, out of eater eats, uh, out of strong sweets. Well, they had a week of drinking and a week with each other. A couple days into it, they start getting frustrated. So they extorted Samson's wife. They threatened her and her father with death, by fire specifically. And um, they wore her down, and then she wore Samson down. As we look at his life unfold, and particularly thinking of the tremendous, overwhelming influence and power that his mother had over him, nothing wrong about that. Seems like, actually seems like God kind of set that up that way. But we see him having a remarkable inability to handle displeasing the key women uh, in, in his life and the rest of it. So she wore him down crying 
and calling into question his love for her. You don't love me. How could you not love me and bring me in on the team here about the riddle? We could get really rich off this, and I'm not even going to be a part of it. And then Samson, not known for his sensitivity, says, uh, I didn't even tell my mom and dad. Why would I tell you? <laughs> okay. So after a, a week or a, a few days of this, she wears him down, and then he tells her. And she tells the 30 companions. Let me tell you about these companions. They were not his friends. Maybe a couple of them were. They were brought in when the Philistines, probably the father, took a look at Samson. There's no indication that he was some kind of a, you know, some kind of a great strong man. But for whatever reason, they took, they took a look at him and brought in 30 companions. But actually, the words are more guards and the word is more brought in is they took or conscripted 30 companions. They were watching him really, really closely. So she told them, and the word went out and made the answer to the riddle common. The men of the city heard it. Everybody knew the answer. You'd think they'd just go right up to Samson and, and tell him right away. They waited until the seventh day of the festivities. When the sun went down and Samson was finally going to enter into a tent with his wife and sleep with her and consummate his marriage, he'd waited for this moment. This is his honeymoon night. They waited for that moment to tell him the riddle. Um, they noticed their timing at a time that would bring the greatest suffering and pain and depth of humiliation to the man. Think about humiliating somebody in that situation. The way they shared it was also mocking. They shared it in a poem, not a propositional statement, but a, a question that was two lines of three words per line, the same as he had done to them. What sweeter honey? What stronger lion? They mocked him in how they even shared what was the answer. And they didn't even make it an answer. They made it a question. They made it their own riddle for Samson to solve. And they were cruel and mocking also because Samson was standing next to his wife who had betrayed him. They used his wife the most important thing in his life, and they turned her. So she lived a lie in front of him for days, having betrayed him, and they beat him by using his wife. You wonder why he went through his life scarred and broken and not right? Well, he knew that he'd been betrayed by his wife, so he immediately insulted his wife. Uh, he didn't suffer well. He called her basically a young cow. If you hadn't plowed with my young cow, you wouldn't have won the riddle. In other words, I know you used her to betray me, and I know you never would have won on your own. He cheated them, and then they cheated him. So Samson goes into a town called Ashkelon, and there we see the Spirit of the Lord entering him making him strong and powerful, and he makes about a 20-some-mile trip further down the valley to the town of Ashkelon. You can go to its ruins today. And he finds 30 men, husbands, fathers, sons, 30 men who did not deserve to be murdered in their city, and he murders them, and he steals their clothing. He creates the widows, the orphans, and the grieving families of 30 men who had the misfortune to be Philistines. And he makes his way back, gives the clothing to the companions they brought in for him, and still enraged, he just goes home and moves back in with, uh, with mom and, and dad. And um, his wife was given over to his companion. 
I don't know if it was another Philistine or another Jew, but the writer goes out of the way to say to make matters even worse, his wife was given to a companion of his. The marriage wasn't consummated. Now it was annulled. They'd gone through a week of partying, but they weren't really married. You see the, the, the disaster of this young man's life? Not something you just get over. Well, the big idea was that faith claims even in this great pain and disaster, it clings to the promise that God is at work even when we don't see it. Samson's tragedies were this. He had unchecked desires in his life that hurt him and hurt him badly and it also hurt the people that he loved. He didn't have to do that to his mom and dad and ultimately he didn't have to do that to his wife despite her troubles. There was trust that was forever lost between him and his wife. His, his marriage was lost. He brought shame to his family, shame to the family of his wife, and danger to the family of his wife. And he murdered 30 innocent men. Um, he created this wake of death and tragedy at such a young age, and, and, and it followed him around the rest of his life. He learned some lessons through this event that we'll see play out also. The lessons that Samson learned after all of this stuff happened is that people that I love can hurt me, and they will hurt me. Loving people will hurt me. Also, he learned the Philistines are not my friends. He grew up with them. That racial ethnic group is not my friend, and they aren't my friends. He also learned that he had a miraculous source of strength available to him that could, could lead him to do things that no other people could ever do and that that strength could be used in service to his feelings. He also learned that Philistines can be killed just like anyone else. In a class society with a master class ruling, the underclass ends up believing that the overclass is a little superhuman and that they would be really hard to die and to kill and all of that, he learned, oh no, they die just like anyone else, especially when I'm at work. And he also learned, most sadly, the thing that follows him the rest of his life, I am all alone in this life. I'm on my own. I'm on my own. So on the outside, we see a rash and foolish, violent young man but behind the scenes, we're told, it's whispered to us by the writer of this, that God is at work in this disaster, in this train wreck of a life. God is at work. God exposed the superficial, compromised nature of the relationship between the Jews or the, the Hebrews and the Philistines. God brought it out. God brought it out that there's a value difference between his people and them, those Philistines that they had become so comfortable living with. God exposed to them in a clear way the underlying prejudice and disdain that the Philistines held the Hebrews in. They saw it played out in front of their eyes. God exposed the differences between the values of the Hebrews and the values of the Philistines. God began to set in motion a new relationship between the Hebrews of southern Israel and the surrounding Philistines. Remember it said God be, would begin to deliver his people through the hand of Samson? Well, the beginning is here, and it concludes with David, uh, what a generation later, finally subduing completely the Philistines. So this all started here, and God is setting in motion what would be their their deliverance, and it looks so terrible on the outside, or to watch it and to tell the story, and yet the Bible has the audacity to invite you and me to trust that God is at work when our lives are a train wreck, when we have driven the train. I don't know if you make a train jump the tracks when we have made the wreck and the disaster. This is Samson's fault. When we sabotage our own lives and when those we love sabotage our life and when local enemies and prejudiced people and people that would treat us with disdain or hatred or mockery or any of that, when they purposefully attack 
and ruin our lives. You get the picture I'm, I'm saying is, doesn't really matter whose fault it is. What matters is that you're standing in the middle of the street surrounded by chrome and plastic and glass and blood. And, and it's a disaster. And the Bible has the audacity to suggest that you, Christian, can look around you at the rubble of, the, of life, what you've done, what's been done to you, all that you've lost, and you can actually say, God is a God of purpose. I just might not see it yet. He didn't see it yet. He didn't see it in his whole life. He didn't see it. But there he is in the book of Hebrews. What is it? Chapter 11, the great hall, the, the great list of the faithful men and women of God throughout the scripture. There's Samson. I, def I ask, I def man, I challenge you to a riddle. No, I, I, I challenge you to read through the life of this man and show me where he grasps his great calling of God and is a godly man and a godly leader. You won't find it. You won't find it. You, I mean, people have tried really hard to do it, but eh, not really. In fact, the best they can say is, well, uh, at one point in his life, it looks like he had 20 years where he didn't go to a prostitute or kill anyone. <laughs> you know? Wow, that's a high bar. <laughs> you won't find it. And yet there he is with his failed, Paul, his failed life at this particular point and moving on, uh, being used by God and part of God being at work despite the tragedy. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So if God was that way, in, in Hebrews as we read it, God doesn't change and is faithful. He was at work in Samson's life uh, to be faithful through this. The Bible challenges you and me as Christians, as, as believers, and it even presents the great opportunity if you're here and you're not a Christian today. It presents an opportunity to, to actually look at the tragedies of your life and the hard things and by something called faith, actually trust that God is doing something that you just can't see at the moment. That's where I leave you today because I... Well, that's where Samson leaves us today, and that's where I suppose I have to leave you as you go through your tragedies and disasters and troubles. It would be disingenuous of me to say, see, look at all the trouble you're having. Don't worry about it. God is at work. He never closes one window without opening another. Nothing but a great, bright future for you because God is always at work. Cheer up. Have some casserole. It's going to be okay. <laughs> Um, no. Aren't the worst things that happen at funerals when somebody says something kind of like that? Well, what are your plans now? I mean, after we get him buried. What, what are you thinking? Back to school or, you know? I mean, these, these just breathlessly ignorant, horrible things that are said. They're being said to try to deal with the discomfort of the fact that in tragedy we don't see plans and we don't feel good and we don't see God mightily at work at all. But the challenge of faith is to believe and to act as if God is at work and then see what he does. Please pray with me.